Okay, so now we're ready to talk about some of the treatment modalities. And for more information on this, you might want to check out chapter, I believe it's 41. Um, anyway, one of the more common treatments for fractures um, is a cast. And a cast is preferable because the patient can't take it off. Um, it's a little bit more permanent. Um, plaster casts are very common. They're uh, made from plaster Paris strips. The advantage of a plaster cast is that it's very moldable. Um, it gives you, because it takes so long to dry, it gives the practitioner a little bit more time to mold the cast. It's especially good for people who are less experienced at casting um, because fiberglass dries so quickly that if you make a mistake, it's kind of harder to correct. Whereas plaster, you can manipulate a little bit more. However, plaster casts are heavier and they take longer to dry. Um, so there are some advantages um, to having a fiberglass cast. Fiberglass casts are waterproof. The padding may not be. Um, all these casts have a, like a couple layers of stockinette and some padding that goes around them. So even though the fiberglass is waterproof, if the padding is not, then you're still going to need to take care to keep it dry on the inside. Fiberglass is lightweight. Um, it dries a lot faster. Plaster could take up to 24 to 72 hours to dry, like completely dry. Whereas fiberglass is usually dry within an hour or two. Um, it does have a rougher surface. So when you're using the fiberglass material, you need to handle it with gloves because those little shards can be um, irritating to your skin. But they can also be very scratchy for the patient. So you might want to put something over top of it. And I have some pictures of plaster versus fiberglass casts. Let me see if I can find, there's a plaster one. Okay, there you go. Let me put that right there. So there's your plaster cast. And then I'm gonna try and find a fiberglass one. Here's one. And you can see it comes in some fun colors, uh, especially for little kids. Fractures are fairly common in the pediatric population. These are the kids that are hurting themselves on the playground or um, riding their bike or whatever. So it's fun to have um, different color fiberglass they can pick. The girls want pink or the boys want blue or they want superhero colors or whatever. So there's, I mean, it's certainly um, not a main reason to go with fiberglass, but it is kind of a fun advantage. And while we're talking about the different types of casts, we can talk about the different shapes. We have the short arm cast, and that is distal. It's mostly to stabilize fractures of the wrist. Um, and you can see that it does not include the um, elbow joint. We have long arm casts, and that is over here. Um, the long arm cast does encompass everything from the humerus down to the, um, down to the distal extremity. It wraps around the thumb and the hand. Um, and we have the cylinder cast. This is a cylinder leg cast. And it includes the... Um, you know, it goes from the femur all the way down to the uh, malleolus, but it does not include the foot. And there are various reasons for doing this. One thing that you're going to remember, we talked about the five Ps. Well, how are you going to assess the pulse of somebody in a cast like that? Obviously, you're not going to be able to palpate a radial pulse, but you can look at things like cap refill. Um, if you, for some reason, had a person who was in bilateral short arm casts or long arm casts, and you could not palpate a radial pulse, you would, of course, assess with the apical. Um, so those are some different types of casts. And lastly, we have a couple of other kinds of casts. Um, there is a spica cast. And spica casts are commonly used. This is an infant, um, probably had congenital hip dysplasia, which is a dislocation of the hip that happens at birth and these kids can be casted for quite a while um, you can see it's they, there's a window that's cut out for the diaper area um, parents can use some kind of tape like duct tape or moleskin tape to pad that um, so that they can change the diaper and then we have body casts and body casts can be very extensive they are seldom used right now but you will still occasionally see them um, I want to point out that this person has a window cut through the abdominal portion of the cast. And um, that prevents something called cast syndrome, which we'll talk about a little bit later when we talk about complications of casting and fractures. Um, 
basically that allows for expansion of the abdominal region with um, gases or whatever and prevents pressure on the mesenteric artery. Um, body casting is not frequently used, but if you see it, there's a lot of unique considerations with that and we'll get into them a little bit later. Okay, so um, on to the care of casts. This is very important for you as a nurse. And in fact, I'm going to put some stars there because I like stars. Okay, so the very first thing you're going to do is to monitor that patient for any signs of neurovascular compromise. And again, we're talking about the five Ps. We're talking about pain. We're talking about paresthesia, that tingling burning. We're talking about paralysis, the inability to move the extremity distal to the casted area. We're talking about pallor, um, anything that looks pale, cyanotic, if it feels cold, any sign that you're not getting blood flow to that area distal to where you're casting is a warning sign and pulselessness. And again, you know, I've sort of mentioned it before and I'm going to mention it again because it's worth mentioning. Sometimes you will not be able to palpate a pulse in the area distal to the extremity. So instead, you're going to look at things like cap refill. Um, our other intervention is going to be to prevent swelling because one of the complications of casted extremities, if you have an injury and you cast it before swelling has, um, before we've controlled the edema, um, you can create an area of pressure. That cast is going to set and it's going to be it's not going to expand as that tissue expands. So if you get edema underneath the cast and there isn't room for that, um, you're gonna end up with something called compartment syndrome, which we will talk about later. The ways that we're going to prevent swelling for this person, um, ice, elevation, we might include some NSAIDs to reduce the inflammatory response, um, but we definitely wanna make sure that this patient doesn't get um, areas that create pressure within the cast. So we're gonna control that edema. With plaster casts, now remember fiberglass casts, depending on how many layers of material you're using, they could be dry in a half an hour, they could be dry in one or two hours, but they're not gonna be um, a long-term thing. They're gonna dry very quickly. Plaster casts, on the other hand, depending on how many layers of casting material, could take up to 72 hours to dry completely. So we need to take special care with a plaster cast. You need to avoid indenting it. If you see somebody um, try and handle this cast with their fingertips before it's dry, stop them immediately. Teach them to handle with the palms of their hands, not the fingertips. Um, if you get areas of indentation, let's say you even rest it on something that has an edge, um, you're gonna get an area of pressure and that person can get a pressure ulcer inside the cast and there's nothing you can do short of opening that cast up to treat it. Some other nursing interventions that we're going to use, um, we're not going to set that cast on anything with hard edges. You don't wanna put it on the edge of a bedside table or on the side rail. Um, you might wanna even elevate that on a pillow. You're gonna position this patient so that warm, dry air can circulate around that cast and promote faster drying. Um, you're gonna use gloves to touch the cast so that all that wet plaster doesn't end up on your hands and that you're not making um, a huge mess. You're gonna monitor for drainage on the outside of the cast with a soft felt tipped marker. Again, no ballpoint pens. You don't wanna make an indentation. You're gonna circle that drainage, date it, and time it. That way we can see if it's spreading. You're gonna pad the sharp areas of the cast with moleskin or other adhesive. And that's kind of important because that can cause a lot of irritation to the skin. So um, usually there's stockinette under the cast. Sometimes the, the person who's casting the extremity will roll the edge of that stockinette um, over the cast so that it makes sort of a smoother edge. But if not, um, certainly you can take some moleskin tape and I'm gonna bring some in for our class activities and show you what that might look like and we're gonna practice um, pedaling a cast. Okay, so when you're teaching the patient or the family member to take care of a cast, um, as the cast is being applied, it might start to feel warm. This happens both with fiberglass and plaster casts, but my understanding is that it is more um, intense with the plaster casting. Um, you're going to also educate that patient not to let anything dent the cast. You're going to do the same things that we just talked about. You're going to teach them to elevate the extremity 
to use ice bags um, and not to rest it on anything sharp or hard. You really need to teach your patient. Casts can get very, very itchy. Um, so we can give them some anti-itching medication, but they ne you never want to let that person try and scratch under there with a, you know, I've seen people try and take coat hangers, rulers, pencils. Never, ever, ever insert a foreign object into the cast. Now, this is really important when you're dealing with children, um, especially with those long casts that cover a joint. The um, long arm casts in particular will kind of keep that arm in a 90 degree angle. And if they stick a quarter down there or a raisin or, you know, God knows what, they kids are kids, um, you can get something that creates a lot of pressure. You can get something that creates infection. So you want to really teach that parent, that family, and the child not to place any foreign objects inside the cast, not to try to scratch it with anything. Um, and you're looking at the long term. People can be casted for, you know, six weeks, longer sometimes. Keep that cast dry. You're not going to tell them not to shower. We're just going to cover it with plastic bags when you're showering or bathing. And one thing that I did see in um, the up-to-date reference was that a technique that's preferred is um, to take one plastic bag and secure it with silk tape so that it overlaps the bag in the skin and then take another plastic bag and put that over the first plastic bag, tape it around again. Um, and also if you can teach that person to sort of keep their arm out of the shower or their leg out of the tub, um, that will help. Again, the fiberglass casts tend to be waterproof, but the padding sometimes is and sometimes isn't. Um, the synthetic padding material that they make um, is waterproof and they can get that cast wet. Um, but if the cast, if a plaster cast gets wet or if say the cotton padding underneath a fiberglass cast, if it's not that synthetic waterproof material, if that gets wet, it can take a long time to dry and it can be a, um, a medium for bacteria to grow. And you're also gonna teach your patient to report the signs and symptoms of a complication. You definitely want your patient to let your let their provider know if they have pain that gets worse. Um, usually, when you cast something or immobilize it, it gets the pain gets better. Um, or if that pain is unrelieved by medication, um, usually the NSAIDs or Tylenol can work. In the first couple of days, they might even prescribe an opioid or narcotic medication. Tell the patient to report if they feel a hot spot that is painful. Um, if there's any damage to the cast. You're also going to have them look out for those same five P's. Um, so these are some things that you want to teach your patient to report to their doctor. Some other things that we're going to tell people to do. Try to wiggle your fingers or toes hourly when you're awake, and this will promote circulation to those extremities. It will also preserve some range of motion and function. And it will also let them know if they can't wiggle their fingers or toes or if they're having those burning shooting pains that there's a problem. Um, and we're going to tell them to follow their doctor's suggestions for weight bearing. Um, if the doctor says off your feet for four weeks and crutch walking only, then that's what they need to do. Um, same thing if you have an injured upper extremity, you're going to make sure that that person follows their doctor's recommendations for lifting or use of that arm. Um, while we're talking about arm injuries, um, when you're casted, especially in a long arm cast, whether it's a cylinder cast or a cast that encircles the hand um, and wrist, that patient may need to wear a sling and that sling will keep the arm elevated. Okay, so as we said, a sling elevates that extremity and takes the pressure off the neck muscles and um, kind of distributes it a little more evenly along the trunk. And this is best when the patient is ambulating. Generally, when they're seated or resting, they should have the arm elevated on a pillow um, so they can remove that periodically, but when they're ambulating, um, it's important to sort of take that pressure off. For the patient with a casted lower extremity um, or immobilized lower extremity, some people have um, hinge braces or other devices, um, we're going to teach this person to either sit in a recliner several times a day with their legs elevated or lay down in a recumbent position with the legs elevated um, to promote venous return and control swelling. We're going to have we're going to have to teach them how to walk with crutches or walkers if they are able to. Um, if it is one extremity, usually they'll be taught crutch walking. Um, if they can bear some weight, 
they may be assisted with walkers or other devices. And if weight bearing is permitted, um, you may have to reinforce that cast with a cast boot or a cast shoe, some kind of rubber bottom um, that protects the cast and reinforces it while they're uh, walking. So when the patient's ready to have their cast removed, we're going to teach them what to expect. Um, for one thing, it's a little bit unnerving sometimes. You take a cast off a patient and maybe one leg has normal muscle tone and normal color. It's been exposed to the skin. It's had some exercise. <clears throat> and then you take this cast off this other extremity and it's weak, it's atrophied, it's smaller, it's paler, um, and that skin can be very flaky and itchy and dry. Um, it can be a little unnerving just to look at that, so if you tell them to expect that. Um, also, the instruments that are used to remove casts, there is a little, it looks like a Dremel tool, um, but the edges are really blunt. You can't really cut skin with it. Um, they should know that it's loud, it's noisy, and that there may be little um, fragments of plaster or fiberglass that sort of spray outward. So you need to teach them to expect that. Then the um, padding will be cut with scissors. When the cast comes off, we're going to offer these people skin care. You can use a lotion like Eucerin cream or some other like heavy emollient and teach them to do the same. Teach them not to scratch at it. Teach them not to rub it. Um, because they've lost um, the opportunity to exercise that extremity, you're going to see some muscle atrophy in that area. Um, there's going to be some stiffness from all that immobility. So this person is probably going to need physical therapy. Um, they're going to need to regain their strength and flexibility slowly. And they won't be uh, probably up to their normal level of activity until they regain that function. Um, we want to teach them to control swelling. Sometimes that cast comes off and now that the extremity is bearing weight or it's um, being asked to do some work, there can be some muscle swelling. So we're going to teach them to elevate, um, but you don't want it higher than the heart. So there are some complications related to casting. And again, I'm giving you the reference, um, your med search textbook, pages 1107 to 1110. And it's not you know, consistent. Sometimes you'll have a discussion of upper body casting and then followed by lower body casting. But there are different complications that you can see with people who are casted. And one that we've already sort of covered is acute compartment syndrome. And compartment syndrome is probably the most serious Thing that you will see and the most um, common complication you'll see with a cast, um, common serious syndrome. Disuse syndrome is also um, something you see, but compartment syndrome is a limb threatening problem. Um, it is a, when you have severe neurovascular compromise. And this is why it is so important to check the five P's. I mean, I know I this is probably the seventh or eighth time I've mentioned it. Um, but I kind of hope you're getting the message that you really need to assess neurovascular status very frequently. Compartment syndrome, again, I'll just review it briefly, is when there is um, in decreased blood flow um, within the muscle compartment because there's increased pressure to that muscle compartment. Either it comes from internal swelling, um, edema, um, which causes the muscle to swell against the fascia, or it's coming from external causes. In this case, it's caused by a cast. can also be caused by splints or braces that are too tight, but splints and braces are adjustable. They can be removed. A cast, once it's on, um, it's hard to see what's going on underneath, so you really need to look at those extremities. And the first P is pain, and really, really think about pain because um, once a person is casted, they may have some pain, but it is usually much less severe um, than before the fracture was reduced and immobilized. So um, when you have somebody who's got pain that's not relieved by pain medication, that is severe with passive motion, that's one of the hallmarks. Let me just put it here so that you don't forget it. Pain with passive motion. Okay, um, and that's the typical textbook presentation. You see it on a lot of test questions and CLEX questions. Um, pain that's out of proportion to the injury. Pain that gets worse instead of getting better. 
and pain that is unrelieved with normal pain, me pain relief measures. So you've given this patient Percocet, you've given them Motrin, you've put ice on the cast, you've elevated it, and now the fracture's immobilized and they are still having all this pain. Um, that's acute compartment syndrome usually. That's what that looks like. Um, and again, this is something that becomes very serious very quickly. A person can lose permanent function within four hours of the onset of symptoms. So it's something you need to be aware of. And certainly when they're first casted for the first 24 hours, you need to check this person at least hourly. And really the first hour after, I would check more frequently than that, maybe every 15 minutes. Um, what may happen, it's always best to wait to cast somebody until um, the edema has peaked. However, most people go to the emergency room after a fracture. They're not there for several days. We don't wait that long to reduce and immobilize. So they may be casted before the edema has really had a chance to um, peak. So it's important, the prevention for compartment syndrome with a cast, um, make sure you're elevating that extremity, make sure you're using ice, um, and really assess, 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 and teach that patient what to look for. Do not let them go home thinking that it's normal to have extreme pain, to have that tingling and burning and um, pale toes. People who you know have never had a broken bone might not know that these things are signs of a, se of a severe complication. Um, and so if you've sedated somebody um, to get that cast on, Definitely don't just take it for granted that they understood what you told them. Verify that they have a caregiver who can um, also understand this information. And if that caregiver doesn't seem to understand, um, don't let that person leave until they somebody is responsible for assessing that patient and um, calling a physician or taking that person to the emergency room um, when a complication arises. Um, the treatment for acute compartment syndrome is something called bivalving and I have a good picture of a cast that's been bivalved I'll just show it to you here it is okay and you can see that cast was split longitudinally um, down the front and the back it can also be split down the sides um, although it's easier when it's a lower extremity like that to split it down the, um, the front of the shin and the calf um, and then what you would do is put the cast back on except that it's got that opening now, and now you can tie it with an ace bandage. Um, you can secure it with an ace bandage, or you can tape it together, but you wanna leave some room for swelling to occur. Um, and bivalving can be done just to relieve that pressure. It can also be used for pressure ulcers. Um, so that's an important intervention. And that is our second discourse on acute compartment syndrome. So I hope you remember that for later. We'll probably do some in-class activities on that um, just so that you're aware because it is probably one of the more, most um, significant things and one of the things that requires immediate attention. So now we're going to turn our attention to pressure ulcers. And we know all about bed sores. Um, pressure ulcers can also occur within a cast, obviously, um, but we can't always assess really well what's going on with the skin when it's covered. So we have to rely on a patient report. And this is why it's really important to teach your patients. Report any hot spot or localized pain. You know, you have an area that hurts more than the rest of it. It's normal to have some aching all through the fracture, but if you have one spot that really, really hurts and it feels hot and it feels um, inflamed, that is most likely the development of a pressure ulcer. Um, you are also going to teach that person to report any drainage on the outside of the cast or foul odor coming from the cast. fix that a little bit. Um, teach the patient, I mean I know this is repeating myself but it never hurts. Never put anything down the cast. 
Um, and this is important because if you have something that goes down the cast, you know, say you have somebody who's trying to scratch and they drop a pencil in there, you know, that pencil puts extra pressure on where the cast is. Between the cast and the padding, there might be a little bit of room. Um, like I said, children are notorious for putting things in places that don't belong. So you really need to be vigilant with this because that can cause a pressure ulcer. And the problem with pressure ulcers inside a cast is that unless somebody reports it and it's treated very, very um, quickly, you can have extensive tissue damage. And at some point, the person really isn't going to report pain anymore. Um, so you definitely want to do some thorough patient teaching with these people. Um, the way that we treat a pressure ulcer, again, is bivalving that cast, and then you're going to treat the pressure ulcer um, the way that you would treat normal pressure ulcers. The problem with it is, is that in order to change dressings um, or do anything like that, you're going to have to interrupt the casting every so often. You're going to have to remove that ace bandage or that tape around the bivalved cast and go in there and um, do skin care, and that's going to interrupt your healing some. So you know, really um, try to teach that patient all the signs and symptoms. Eventually, if you get that pressure ulcer um, resolved, they can put a new cast on the patient um, that isn't bivalved um, and hopefully avoid further problems. Disuse syndrome is pretty common, and what happens, obviously, as the extremity is not used and the muscles aren't used, you have some stiffness and immobility of the joint, you have muscle atrophy and weakness. Um, and so what we do about this, to prevent it, um, you teach people exercises, isometric exercises. Now I don't know if you guys remember, but back in Unit 3 when we talked about basic needs and mobility, we talked about the difference between isotonic and isometric exercises. Isotonic involves movement of that extremity, and usually some work. You're lifting a weight. That's isotonic. You can't have a person in a cast use isotonic exercise to strengthen their muscles. So what we do teach them is isometric exercise, and that is tightening the muscles while stationary. Okay, so under isometric exercises, and you should really know this for anybody who's um, bedridden for a long period of time, quad setting. Your quadriceps, that big muscle in the front of your thigh. Tell the patient, tighten it, hold it for like 10 seconds, then release it and do that 10 times. Um, that's quad setting. If you need help with this, you can always ask PT to come and help you. There's gluteal setting. And that's the same thing with the gluteal muscle. Tighten, hold it, then release, and repeat that a few times. You can have the person make a fist. And that's going to help their upper extremities stay um, in good shape. It's not perfect, but it will help to prevent um, disuse syndrome. So that's how we deal with that. And obviously when the person's cast is off, they're going to go through a period of PT and rehab to make sure that they um, get function back in that extremity. Okay, so cast syndrome is something that happens more frequently with patients who receive body casts or spica casts, and it can be psychological or it can be physiological. And the psychological component is a lot like claustrophobia that people get in an MRI machine or, um, you know, people who just feel like they're suffocating. And it's an anxiety reaction. You might get an increased heart rate and increased blood pressure and increased respiratory rate, but this is different. Um, than say fat embolism or something like that. This is very um, much provoked by mental state and emotional states. A person might sweat, you might see them get really um, anxious and agitated. So, you know, put a pulse ox on the person. Always if they're agitated and confused and they've had a fracture, assess their respiratory status first. But if really, if they're satting at 100% on room air, you can suspect anxiety. And I don't want you to get confused. When you have a fat embolism, you will see patients who have increased heart rate. You'll see patients who have tachypnea. 
and you'll see patients who get agitated and confused. The difference is that a fat embolism also includes changes to the respiratory system, and usually that person will get um, some respiratory distress, and their blood gases are going to show respiratory uh, acidosis. Um, and so calf syndrome is more of an anxiety issue. Of course, you're going to assess your patient fully anyway, but if it really seems that they are having an anxious reaction and their oxygenation status is fine, then you're going to try and use your therapeutic communication, your relaxation techniques, and you might have to administer some anti-anxiety medication. Um, stay with your patient and talk them through the entire casting procedure. Get them to use some deep breathing, um, maybe play some music, the same things that you would do for any patient who is under stress. Now, also part of cast syndrome, um, people who have body casts, sometimes um, there's a lot of different factors that go into this, but what starts, they have a body cast, okay, that covers their abdomen, and maybe they don't have that window that was cut in. It's hard to assess bowel sounds in a patient in a full body cast uh, for obvious reasons. So um, if this patient who is immobile because they have a body cast um, is going to have decreased peristalsis, they're probably not passing gas. So you need to ask that person frequently, are you passing gas? Do you feel like you need to have a bowel movement? Do you feel bloated? Do you feel distended? Um, because here's what happens. Peristalsis slows down. Gases build up. The abdomen gets distended. It swells against the cast. And now you have pressure on the mesenteric artery, the SMA. Okay, so SMA syndrome can happen with a body cast. Um, now you have decreased blood flow. That mesenteric artery gets crushed against the cast, which won't expand. Um, and now that person's going to get a lot of abdominal discomfort, nausea, vomiting. They can get a paralytic ileus. Um, and the aorta can sustain damage and get ischemic. So... Um, the way that we would treat this is you can use a nasogastric tube to decompress. Um, this person is going to probably be NPO and get IV fluids. Um, they may be treated with medications that promote gastric motility. And um, you might cut a window into the cast to allow room for the abdomen to expand. Okay, so this can be a very serious complication. Fortunately, to be perfectly honest, we don't see a whole lot of body casting anymore. Um, I'm not sure it was really common ever, but um, definitely there are better treatment modalities now that we have superior bracing systems and um, surgical repair of a lot of fractures. You're not seeing as many people in body casts um, it's one of those things, I was looking at material for this, for developing this unit, and I did see a test question that said, you know, in order to prevent um, complications of body casting, the nurse would, and one of the choices was to assess bowel sounds frequently. So I asked a nurse who worked on ortho, I said, how do you assess bowel sounds in a patient in a full body cast without a window? And she said, well, you don't really. Um, and so you would have to assess really in some other way. It's just like that radial pulse issue that I sort of brought up earlier. If you can't get to something to assess it, you still are responsible for um, using your assessment skills to uh, be alert to complications. So um, you want to note other signs and symptoms of um, decreased peristalsis. You want to note if that person is passing gas. You want to note if they're nauseous, if they're vomiting, if they feel bloated, if they feel a lot of abdominal pressure. That's something you need to know and you need to report it um, to the provider because they possibly will do something to help that person. And those are the main complications related to casting in your book. So make sure that you're familiar with all of them. And I'll put stars next to the more common ones that um, show up on exams. Not that, you know, it's all fair game, I will warn you. Um, but I'll tell you for right now, um, Compartment syndrome, definitely. Pressure ulcers, you know, always.
we're always worried about skin integrity as nurses. Um, Cast syndrome and SMA syndrome. You know, I didn't see too many questions in all of your review books or in even in the textbook resources for the instructors. I really didn't see a whole lot on that. I'm not sure ATI won't test you on it. I'm not sure you won't see it on the NCLEX. But those aren't common things that you see. So um, definitely know how to assess for compartment syndrome and pressure ulcers and know what you, were, you would do about them and um, why it's important to report those findings to the provider.